I hate you, I said. And I will never love that bastard child you bring in this house, she said. My mother and I looked across the room at each other in my aunt's living room and the words hung, hung like decorations on a tree in between us. We both looked at each other and every dream my mom had for me was gone and everything I saw in my mom as good was gone as well. We had nothing but those words and those dreams. My mom, Earlene Arnold, oh, I just loved my mom. And at that moment, I went back to all the things I loved about her. She was a, a creative woman. She had been playing the piano since she was a little girl and played piano in her church, which is in Falls Church, Second Baptist Church in Falls Church, which her father actually built. And she played piano and sang in the choir. And I love to sing from her hymn books. It was wonderful. And my mother, who's mostly an introvert, decided and she was asked to do a, a show, a talent show at church. She took her two-year-old little daughter, that would be me, and she brought me on stage. And she said, little brown baby with sparkling eyes, come to your mama and sit on her knee. What you been doing, making mud pies? Look at your child, he's as dirty as me. Quoting the entire poem, Little Brown Baby, by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who she loved. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the African-American writer from the late 1800s, early 1900s, became my first, my first touch into the world of poetry and story that I would live with for the rest of my life. My mom was that creative person. And my mom was the most beautiful person in my world. When my dad, who was in the military, would get all dressed up in his blues and go to the dining ins or dining outs, we'd come in there, the little girls, us three little girls, and we'd sit on their bed as we watched them get dressed. And my dad would put on those bars and we'd say, what is that one? And what is that one? He'd have to identify it over and over and over again. And he looked so wonderful. But then my mom would come out of the bathroom with her long gowns on, particularly the gold lame one that kind of dr drifted in the back. And she would have her hair up and her jewelry on, her face done. And we'd say, Mama, where are you going? She'd say, I'm going to the innermost, to the outermost, to the uppermost, to the lowermost. We never got an answer. <laughs> but it sure sounded good. She was the most beautiful woman I knew. And my mom was a great cook. I mean, a great cook. And people loved to eat her, her food, particularly her bread. She was a wonderful baker. I have two friends of hers that are here. They're like nodding their heads. And so uh, the friends that we lived next to in, in, when we were in Annandale, Virginia, the Alcofers and the Arnolds, me, and then, and then the Fushmans, the, the families, would, the adults would get together and they'd do round robin, a progressive dinner, and eat something at each house. And my mom was known for those desserts. Baked Alaska. If you don't know what baked Alaska is, I am so sorry for your life. <laughs> it was an ice cream pie with a meringue on top that you would flame up <gasps> to die for. And my mom could cook. And my mom was independent. She married him, um, inadvertently had married a military man. My dad was going to do his four years in ROTC and then come out and be a mechanic. My mother said she would be a help. She decided to take accounting classes. 35 years later, my dad left the military. <laughs> and my mother made every single move by herself with one, two, or three little girls in tow. My father was either already gone or he was still working all day long. My father would always remember the time where he came home and his lovely wife was literally running after the moving truck yelling, stop! because they had accidentally packed something that wasn't supposed to be packed. My father just pulled the car into the driveway and waited to be berated when he got, she got home. And my mom was the most resourceful woman I knew. One of my greatest memories is of my mom 
my mother's mother coming, my grandma, we called her big grandma, and my god sister Kim coming in, and my big grandma's dream was to always go to Holland and see the tulips. That was her dream. So in Germany, she came over, and, and my mom set up this wonderful trip for myself and my grandmother, well, for her and my grandmother and the three girls and my god sister to go. Well, my dad said he couldn't take the time off. My mother said, oh, you don't need to. I have this. She went and she changed in some money and got all the money that she needed for this trip and gave that money to her very faithful mother. And then we got ready. My father was still had second event. My mother was like, we have this. We got in the car. We went to go get gas because we were about an hour or so away by this time. We get to go get gas. And right after we got gas, that's when my grandmother started frantically looking in her purse frantically looking and opening every single pocket, digging underneath her, digging in places that we didn't need to really understand at that moment, but moving everything she could to see. And when my mom said, what's wrong? Um, I think I left the money back home. She had. Well, mom had a choice to go forward or to go back. She was not about to go back and look at my, her husband and say, oh, we didn't get there. She had just enough in her pocket. It was before the day of credit cards. So the only credit card she had was the one that was for gas that could go only to American Post. So she was hopeful that we would make it up there and make it back. We'll be good. And we went on. It was extraordinary. She explained to us girls, we would not have a lot of money, but we would make the best of it. We found a B&B with the deepest, fluffiest feather bed I have ever been in in my life. Four of us girls, three of us girls slept in that. Grandma and mom and the baby sister slept in the other one. Then came breakfast, the B part of B and B. And my mom told us to eat slowly <laughs> because we were going to be on an adventure. We were like, yeah. And everybody left the table. She said, get all the bread and everything you can get off the tables. And we went and we filled our pockets. We put in napkins. We pulled everything we could get off the table, the sauces, the juice, the jellies, everything. Every, and, we, and that was our meal for the day. It was great. We were like in on the secret. And we were all given just a little bit of money. And she said, girls, this is all you have. So buy that one thing you want to remember this trip on. Buy that and be careful. And we were. And she still made it possible for my mom, to, her mom, to go to a tulip place. It wasn't in the field. It was a, a plant shop that had lots of tulips in it. But she got to see tulips, and there was a windmill on the way. We rode on the boat in, on the, uh, in Amsterdam. And then we visited all of, little, all of Amsterdam by visiting the miniature version of Little Amsterdam. And we went all over that. And at the end, my mom bought us a drink. It was just a soda with fuzz on it and stuff. But it was a drink in a big fancy cup with this long straw and a monkey around the end of the straw. It was the wonderful part. And we went away. And when we got home, my dad said, how did it go? It was the best trip ever. Which, of course, did not make him happy because he was not a part of it. That was my mom. And then I turned into a teenager. And well, that's when I realized my mother was not perfect. As a matter of fact, sometimes the things that she said were like hypocritical. Say one thing, do another. And my mom looked at me and said, she found boys, bad deal. And I had, and we were a friction. And then my dad left for a year, my senior year of high school. He left and he left the two of us in the house by ourselves with just my younger sisters. We decided the best way to get along was never to see each other. And so we did, Then I graduated. And things changed and we were back together. My mom went over to Germany where my father was and I went to college. And my mom would even make my favorite cake and wrap it so well she could send it through the mail and I would get it fresh. But here I was, a junior in college. And I was six, I was five months pregnant. I was explaining to my mother that I was keeping this child we were right here in Alexandria, 
trying to have a conversation that could not happen because all she saw was her daughter's dreams going down the toilet. And I already felt bad enough. I didn't need her to tell me. And so we stared at each other across the room, across those words. And I walked out. And she eventually got on a plane and went back to Germany. And we didn't talk. Eventually that baby came. It was 1986 then. That baby boy came, Christopher. It happened to be that my father was in the United States for a conference when he was born. So he drove on down and, and he got to meet that little boy and fell in love. Head over heel. It was his boy because all he'd had was girls. So now he had that boy. He loved that boy. And he promptly purchased everything he could at Sears with his credit card. And then he took pictures of every outfit the child had been purchased. And the child had pictures with them. And then a couple months later, my sister who hadn't been back in the States to see family in three years, she came back and she came and she got to meet her nephew. She had already bought him shoes that were three months too big for him. And, and, and she could not wait to see him. And she took mounds of pictures. And then it was a family reunion. So I went with the little baby in the family reunion. Everybody passed the baby around, and there were mounds of pictures. And all these pictures kept going back to that woman over in Germany that I was not talking to. And she was not talking to me. But Christmas came. I was still in college, and Christmas was always the time I went back home. But now I had this seven-month-old baby, this baby of the hate, this baby of the words. I got on the plane, and my son was wonderful. He slept, and he played, and he smiled. That was good, because all I had in me was just fear. I was going home to see my, I was going to see my mom. We hadn't talked at all, not once. I sweat and I, my hands were, my hands were wet as I, I packed things to, to get ready to get off the plane and my son was so good. And we got through customs with ease and after customs he came to the place where he could see people waiting for you and I could see my dad there. He was gonna see his boy. My sister was jumping up and down and waving her arms, and my mother had no smile on her face. I tried to put my shoulders back, but I was scared. I walked forward, and my mother stepped in front of my father and my sister, and she looked at me without a smile and said, give me that baby and promptly kept the child, and held that child for the next hour in the car, and would not let that child go. Did not speak to him, just held him, and looked at him, and fed him a bottle, and, and I didn't get my child back. And we spent Christmas, and Christopher lit up our worlds. It didn't take but 24 hours for him to get the name Tank because he was walking and destroying everything I was in sight. One day, my mom, after a week, we were sitting at the dining room table. It had been a busy morning with that boy. My dad was home, and my dad was asleep on the couch, and lying on his chest was his boy, sleeping as well. Mom and I, both at the same time, Sighed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we took hands. And we both looked up at that boy. And we together began to dream for him. 